So I'm supposed to talk to you on SGL2 inhibitor and DPP4 fixed dose combination over 20 minutes. So I've got two agenda. What's the rationale? And what is the place in the management of type 2 diabetes? So my next slide, I think, is the most important slide. If you want, you can take a picture of this slide. Now, where is, what is the place of SGLT2 DPP4? Before that, the question is, what is the place of drugs in the management of diabetes? If you look on the right, to your right-hand side, the doctor comes at the very last. This is one message I keep harping again and again and again. Diabetes management is a team effort. You have to control diet. You have to get your patient to exercise. You have to get your patient to monitor his or her blood glucose values. Otherwise, there's no point giving a medicine. Let it be SGLT2 or DPP4. You need active participation from the patient. Do you know what is the adherence rate of the drugs that you prescribe to your patient? Over five years, less than 35%. You are happy writing a prescription of SGLT2 or DPP4, suddenly you have metformin, your patient doesn't even take the drug. You need help from the society. You need governmental help. Just by a show of hands, how many of you have diabetic nurse educators with you in your clinic? No? How many have got dietitians in your clinic? No? So do you think you sitting in your room, spending five minutes with your patient, writing a DPP for SGLT2 will control diabetes? Absolutely not. You're making yourself happy, making money for yourself. But unfortunately, the patient is not, not benefiting. And next thing, just by managing glucose, you will not do much. You have to manage blood pressure, you have to manage lipids. So first you got diet control, exercise, you got the patient to monitor, you got the governmental help, the societal help, you got the patient to believe in you, then you write medication. When you write medication, blood sugar control comes later. Patients die, diabetics die of what death? A cardiovascular death. 60 to 70% of a diabetic patient will have a cardiovascular death. And you cannot prevent a cardiovascular death just by glycemic control. You have to control the blood pressure, you have to control the lipids. And then comes glycemic control. And this combination of com taking all three together, blood pressure, sugar, and diabetes, was very nicely shown in the STINO2 trial. And this is what they did in the STINO2 trial. Diet control, exercise, ACE inhibitors, metformin, glycoside, and the NPH insulin, antihypertensive, antilipid lowering therapy. And this is what it does. It gives you eight years of life back, what diabetes takes away from you. If you don't manage diabetes well, a 60-year-old patient who does not have any cardiovascular complications has loses six years of his or her life. And if this patient at age 60 has got cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular risk factors, loses 12 years of his or her life. That's what you're trying to treat. You're not trying to treat blood sugar. You're trying to prevent the death. You're trying to prevent the complication in your patient. So with that, I have come to the place of management. Place of management is significant. Glycemic management is important. But prior to that, please get these facts right. Now, fixed dose combination. I'm supposed to talk, talk to you about a fixed dose combination of DPP-4 and SGLT2. Now, this is a very nice study. It's a very shameful study, actually. Present in 2015, if you see it published in PLOS Medicine by Patricia Magetikin, and there were a couple of Indians there as well. If you want, you can read through, including people from Mumbai. Use a fixed dose combination drugs in India. How bad it is. The 70 million diabetics in India, 52 metformin FDCs at that time, 2015, approved by DCGI. There are 500 brands of metformin in FDC. I, I'm, I'm sure all of you are using, combined in this room, we were not using 100. Two, 344 of them were banned in 2016. This is an, under legal uh, challenge at the moment. And out of those 344 uh, which were banned, 27 were metformin fixed dose combinations. Why? Because they're irrational combinations. There's no therapeutic justification in those combinations. Each of you know those combinations. I will not go into those details. Thankfully, 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 most of these combinations were non steroidal anti-diabetic agents, antidepressants, benzodiazepines, and antipsychotics. Fortunately for us, if you see the metformin combination, the second bar, it's not that bad. So to show you, in this bad press for FDC, this combination of a DPP-4 and an SGLT-2 is a rational combination. It's a therapeutic combination. This is the pharmacokinetic data of combining an SGLT-2 empagliflozin and a DPP-4 inhibitor linagliptin. If you see the PK, PK is the 
concentration of the drug in the blood, each drug being given separately and the combination being given. If you see the drug combination on the left hand side, it's empagliflozin. On the right side, the linagliptin, it's the same. So by giving in combination, you're not hampering the drug, com the drug concentration of the other molecule. So it's a rational one, it's a studied one, and that's why this will be, this will there, be there for us. Take you through, quickly through two case studies. This we see day in, day out in our practice. 38-year-old male has money. If you have no money, don't talk DPP4, don't talk SGLT2, don't talk GLP1. If you're somebody who's in a village managing poor patients, please leave this room because you will not be using these drugs. Having said that, 20 to 25% of Indians ha are rich. I think all of us in this room can afford DPP4, SGLT2. And you're in Pune, you will be seeing enough patients who can afford. So affordability is out. Patient has to afford. Type 2 diabetic for two years, BMI 26.5, only on metformin one gram BD, which is not bad. One, one drug you start, I, I strongly don't believe in this, but that's how it is. Blood pressure is normal, HbA1 is 8.2, fasting PP there, lipids are controlled, uh, renal function is normal, no atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, no heart failure. Next time you see a patient in your clinic, please go through this. You can't see a patient in two minutes, sorry. All this you have to ask yourself, otherwise you can't prescribe a drug. If the patient walks in, he writes half an hour, metformin, I mean, I, I don't think you're doing diabetes practice. You have to ask, what is the renal function? What is the cardiovascular risk? Is there underlying heart failure? After, after SGLT2 data, which is so strong, you have to ask about heart failure. So person with type 2 diabetes, not a target on metformin alone. HbA1c target is what for you? 6, 6.57. For me, 6.5. If it's a young patient, I, may not, I, I might not hesitate to go down to 6 as well. What will you add? It's an open question. You can add anything that you want. You will never be wrong. You can add a DPP-4. You can add sulfonylurea. You can add pyoglitazone. You can add SGLT2. All of these come as fixed dose combinations. And most of these fixed dose combinations are rational. Or you can add a combination of SGLT2 or DPP-4. Case two, the same patient now. Diabetes is now for, has got older. Diabetes for seven years. Now one of his family members has died of a coronary heart disease. BMI, as we get older, we get fatter, so BMI is 28 now. Already on a second drug, which is a DPP-4 metformin fixed dose combination, blood pressure slowly creeping up. HbA1 is 8.1, had two drugs, so managed from 8.2 to 8.1. Fasting PP, you can see there. Lipids are controlled. This index patient does not have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or heart failure. Renal function is normal, because if renal function is not normal, the whole discussion becomes something different. So this case is person with type 2 diabetes uncontrolled on DPP-4 metformin. What will you do next? Your HbA1c target, to me, this will be 6.5. Some of you might want to do 7. We can argue it's a debate. We will never, that debate will never end. What will you want to add as a third-line drug? SU, SGLT2, TZD, GLP-1 insulin, or you want to keep metformin and a fixed dose of DPP-4, SGLT2. So why is DPP-4 and SGLT2? So now the rationale. Why should you combine these two? Because they are complementary. So husband and wife both have different characteristics. That family sticks together. Husband and wife think the same, eat the same. They never stick together. So DPP-4 decreases its insulin-dependent mechanism, whereas SGLT2 is the insulin-independent mechanism. Decreases glucagon, endogenous glucose production. On the right-hand side, SGLT2 increases glucagon and endogenous glucose production. But that is the mechanistic data. But if you come to clinical data, they both work together. Bring fasting, bring, bring down fasting, bring down PP, and there is minimal or no hypoglycemia. So glyptin is basically, they had high hopes, but it's moderated reality. We all thought that gliptins will do so much, but they're moderated. I mean, they're not bad. They're very good drugs. They're weight neutral, BP neutral. They're cardiovascular safe, except probably sexagliptin, where there was increased heart risk for, risk for hospital heart failure. They did not increase all-cause mortality, did not increase even mortality, and they're renal safe. To, I mean, to, you might even go to the extent of saying that they might get, there might be some renal benefit with DP4 inhibitors. On the right-hand side, gliflozins, I mean, I, I was, we were approaching 2007 for a gliflozin trial. We laughed. I laughed. That how can a drug which causes just glucose coming out from the kidney can have so much of beneficial effect? But we are all, we are all surprised, aren't we? In, 2019, in 2019, we are all surprised because weight reduction, BP reduction, cardiovascular protection, cardiovascular benefit, heart failure benefit, CV, mortal, CV death mortality benefit. Only three drugs have shown CV mortality benefit, empagliflozin, exenatide once weekly, and liraglutide. No other molecules have shown CV mortality benefit. And of course, you heard the credence trial of this presented about renal protection. So combining DPP-4 and SGLT2 makes huge sense. And I am a very, very firm believer of combination therapy. I do not believe in the ADASD guideline, which says give metformin for three months, wait, give a second line drug, third line drug. Sorry, that, that, that those days are gone. And by 2025, I'm sure you will see ADASD guideline, which will say what DeFronzo has been saying since 2007. Combination therapy. Use drugs at, at the beginning. Hit the diabetes heart, after that you can withdraw. 
use two drugs based on uh, path, uh, which, ha, which affect different pathophysiological mechanisms. And these are the eight pathophysiological mechanisms that everybody in this room knows. And now if you see a combined DPP-4 and SGLT2, you can see out of the eight, six are taken care of. There is no good drug as yet which takes care of the neurotransmitter de uh, defect, the gut-brain axis that is still being researched at great length. And if you are using a SGLT2 and DPP-4 inhibitor combination, you do not act on the lipolytic pathway on the top, top left. The only two drugs which work on the lipolytic pathway is oral pioglitazone and, of course, insulin. So that's why it makes huge sense to use pioglitazone in the first 6 to 12 months when you're treating a new onset diabetic because you take care of the lipolytic pathway. So if you combine metformin and the dpp 4 sgl 2 combination, you're taking care of six of the eight pathogenetic mechanisms. Plus, when you use a combination of dpp 4 sglt 2 do you have other benefits? Yes. But before I go, why am I only talking about MPA and Lina? Doctor, will say, Dr. Mukherjee, you're biased. You're not talking about Dapasexa. You're not talking about er 2 sita The reason is very simple. They're not available to us. As of now, all these three combinations are available in the US. You can see that on the left-hand side, USA approved, USFD approved, even er 2 sita is approved there. To us, only the uh, MPA Lina is approved. The uh, DAPA SAXA applied for approval to DCGI has been sent back for more additional data. I don't know when the additional data they will give. So ma in the market, you have Empalina. Just by a show of hands, how many of you are using? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So yes, quite a few of us are using this combination. Reason, so that's why my, my talk gives you an example of Empalina, but the other combinations do the same. Now, this is the, these are the various trials which were done with the combination of DPP-4 and SGLT2 for regulatory approval. I think most of us use this not de novo. We'll never use an Empal uh, uh, Lina in a de novo diabetic. We'll always have the patient on metformin on board. So I'm taking you to the trial which takes metformin plus DPP4 SGLT2 Empal and Lina in combination. Now this slide is very complicated. This one slide will give you the entire answer of, of combining DPP4 and SGLT2. So I put as one, two, three. This is metformin background. These patients were on metformin and then they were given a combination therapy. What is number one? Number one is if you see on a, go from your right to left, linagliptin alone, EMPA-10 alone, EMPA-25 alone. And then when you combine them, of course, when you combine, you get a better glycemic control. If you, if you are uh, observant, you will see all the p-values are given there because they're all in green boxes, they're all positive. So that's point number one. When you combine them, of course, you will get better glycemic control. Now look at the point, point number two. Point number two is very important. It's a baseline HbA1c. Baseline HbA1c in all these trials, in this trial, was about 7.9 to 8%. And now you look at the graph again. At 8% baseline value, which gives you better glycemic control? The DPP-4 or SGLT2? The DPP-4. See linagliptin. Linagliptin HbA1c control is better than MPA or 10 or MPA25 when you compare them separately. So when a baseline HbA1c is less, SGLT2 inhibitors do not work so well alone. So if you combine them, you get better effect. Number three, point to note from this slide is it's not additive. If you add 0.7 and say 0.6, it should be 1.36% reduction when you take MPA 5 and 10, but you don't. You get minus 1.08. There are a lot of reasons to this. We'll discuss that later if you have time in the question answer session. But these are three things that you should know when you combine DP4 and SGLT2. When you combine, you will get better control. Obviously, it's a no-brainer. If your HBA wants you to start with is below 8.5, if you use them separately, DP4 will work better than SGLT2. And if you add them, you will not get an additive effect. You will get a better effect, but not an additive effect. Same thing is shown here in the same trial. I, I think it's a, a repetition of the, of the slide. Just to show you that this is not with MPA Lina alone, this happens with the other three, two combinations as well. If you see, this is the MPA Lina data. If you see the uh, number of people, the proportion of patients getting HbA1c to less than 7%. If you combine them, 58 to 60%. But if you take them separately, 28 to 31%. Now, if you take the other combination, which is DAPA and SEXA, available in the USA, not available to us. Again, if you see, if you combine DAPA SEXA, you get better glycemic control. Same three points are there. If it's, it's not additive, here if you see, the HbA1c baseline is 9%. That's why DAPA alone works better compared to SEXA. 10 DAPA works better than 5 SEXA. Why? Because the baseline HbA1c is high. Higher the baseline HbA1c, SGLT2 does better than a DP4 inhibitor. And similar data, you see with a combination of ER2-CITA. ER2-CITA, ER2 is not yet, ER2-Gliflozin is not yet marketed in India. 
probably it will come to us probably next year. If you take R2 Sita again, the same three things, when you combine them together, you get better glycemic control. But uh, if you take individually, here the baseline HB1 is 8.6. If you see Sita Glyptin does better than the SGLT2 inhibitor. Now, apart from uh, 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 glycemic control, there are various pleiotropic effects. We know that. Just to show you that, that when you combine them, you do not negate the beneficial effect of one form of the other. So we all know that SGLT2 causes about 2 to 4 kg weight loss, and that effect is seen in this trial. Average weight loss was 2.6 to 3 kilograms. We all know that they cause systolic and diastolic blood pressure reduction. All of you who have seen the empiric outcome trial know that, 4 and 2 millimeter drop in the empiric outcome trial. Same thing you are seeing here about about 3.6 to 2.2 millimeter drop. You would say there's a very min minuscule amount of drop, 3 and so 4 and 2, but go back and read your di hypertension literature, it's a huge, a 4 millimeter uh, uh, median drop is a huge drop. And if you see, we all know that uh, empagliflozin has got uh, cardiovascular benefit. We all know that there was cardiovascular death reduction to the tune of about 38%. And we all know the Carmelina trial. If you do not know, you will be hearing about Carmelina, I'm sure, many times. And Carmelina was neutral. So you're combining the two drugs, and you're going to get the benefit of SGLT2 inhibitor. Possible renal benefits. Renal benefits with SGLT2, the strongest data to date is now with canagliflozin because they did the, the credence trial, because they, they, had, they had the renal outcome as a primary endpoint. In the MPA, in the MPA reg outcome trial, the renal benefits are exploratory outcome, secondary exploratory outcome, because they were not pre-specified, they were pre-specified but not looked at carefully. But having said that, I think it's a class effect, the renal benefits with, with, DPP, with SGLT2 inhibitors. So there was a reduction with the uh, empagliflozin, and in Carmelina trial, we all know that there was reduction in albuminuria. So you're combining them, and you're getting more and more benefit. Now, safety profile, if you combine them, do you cause any issues? Answer is no. Hypoglycemia is not higher. Incidence of urinary tract infection is not higher. The only thing which I find hard to explain is apparently, if you use them in combination, the risk of genital infections is less. Everybody in this room who have used an SGLT2 inhibitor know how irritate, irritating it is, isn't it? You start an SGLT2, two weeks later you get a call, Doc Saab, what have you done? You've got a lot of pain, infection. Apparently, when you combine them both together, the risk of uh, uh, the genital, genital infections, the genital fungal infections are less. There are a few reasons for it. I don't want to go into it. Just the take-home messages when you combine, the genital infections are less. So, in summary, I think all that I said is there in this slide. Addresses multiple pathophysiological defects. We know that, six out of eight. High efficacy of providing significant reduction. Remember, combination gets you better reduction, but it's not additive. Early achievement of glycemic goal. I just rushed through that slide, but take it from me that you get the HbA1 reduction earlier. And again, it's a no-brainer, right? If you use a DPP-4 SGL2 separately, and if you use two drugs together. Three to five times higher odds of patients reaching goal HbA1c. You saw those three towers I showed you with the Mpalina, Dapasexa, and Ertusita. When you combine them, you get much higher number of people coming to less than 7% as compared to when you're using each one separately. Offers significant weight reduction is not that you get better weight reduction, is that adding Lina to Empa in a fixed dose combination does not negate the weight loss effect of empagliflozin. Same thing, combining together does not negate the significant systolic and diastolic blood pressure reduction which you see with empagliflozin or for that matter the other two SGLT2 inhibitors, DAPA and ertugliflozin. Cardiorenal protection and CV death reduction is maintained and proven CV safety and renal safety is there with linagliptin. So combining that, if you suppose you combined, uh, suppose you combine empagliflozin with saxagliptin, then it becomes a bit of an issue. Here there is heart failure benefit, here there's increased heart failure. When you combine them, what will happen? So that becomes confusing. But here you're combining linagliptin, which Carmelina trial tells you is quite safe with regards to CP base and hospital heart failure. And if you take uh, uh, empagliflozin, it reduces. So when you combine, there is no negative effect. Number nine is there's no absence of any additional safety. By combining them, we do not change the drug levels of each or the other. And there are no uh, additional safety. Rather, there might be a benefit of reduction in genital, genital tract infections. And of course, as I started with my talk by saying compliance, if you are serious, you ask your patients. Ask your patients to be open to you. You'll be surprised. I have patients with type 1 diabetes on four times a day insulin. When I keep asking slowly, slowly, they say, Dr. Saab, four 
एक तो हफ्ते में दो बार मिस हो ही जाता है कभी कभी हफ्ते में दो मिस हो जाता है इट्स इम्पॉसिबल फॉर ह्यूमन बींग टू टेक फोर शॉर्ट्स एवरी डे ट्वेंटी एट शॉर्ट्स वीक हाउ मनी हंड्रेड हंड्रेड आउट शॉर्ट्स मंथ सो दे मिस Compliance is a big issue. I'm sure some of you must be taking some kind of medicines here and there, maybe chronically. Ask yourself how compliant you are to the medication. Studies have shown, but these are biased studies. These are uh, retrospective studies. These are uh, studies from the community where they show that not more than 35 to 38 percent of your patients take the pills. So if you have lesser pill burden, probably it will be better. So with that, I will leave you with this last uh, algorithm. Uh, this is not my algorithm. This is an algorithm by Dr. Goldenberg from Canada. But, but, but uh, it's a very nice algorithm, and I believe in it. That's why I'm showing it to you. If uh, somebody's on metformin monotherapy, HbA1c is more than 7%, but less than 8%. If you want to cut costs, you can go, go ahead with DPP-4 for better glycemic control. But remember, look at the top. What is what it says on the top? In patients without CVD with eGFR more than 45. If the same patient had CVD, then of course it will be SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor agonist. But most of the patients that you and I see, only people with empiric outcome trial inclusion criteria, I think there will be one in nine patients that you see in your clinic will have that empiric inclusion criteria. Eight of them will be ballpark type 2 diabetic patients with hypertension, hyperlipidemia. They won't have established cardiovascular disease. So in that situation, you can use metformin DPP-4, but if your patient can afford, then you could also think of adding an SGLT2, even though I am not very convinced about the, the SGLT2 data with regards to primary prevention. I'm still not convinced. Uh, uh, we can have a debate. Declare to me does show in primary prevention there's reduction of CV death or hospital heart failure, but I'm not that convinced. But if you take HbA1c on metformin, it's about more than 8%, then a combination of DPP4 SGLT2 always scores. So in the last 20 minutes, my time is just up. I've taken you through two, two cases, case one, case two. In case one, I would use metformin combination. In case two, I will use metformin combination. With that, I'd like to stop. Thank you. If you have any questions, we can take that.